Okay, now let's talk about what we call the 14 best interview questions. The purpose of this list is to help give you some kind of a guide or a map. Even though some of these questions are really common sense, we thought it would be helpful for you to just have them available so that you could kind of pick and choose the ones that make the most sense to you and then have them in a format. In fact, you're going to be able to get a PDF where you're going to be able to actually have them in your hands. So let's quickly go through these 14 best interview questions. And then Eric and I will comment a little bit about each one. So the first one is we would like you to ask a little bit about the background and expertise of the person. And this will help you to understand whether they are a good fit for your child. And of course, you're going to want to get specifics about what approach the tutor or support specialist uses for reading and writing, because obviously the vast majority of our kids are going to have issues in that area. So the more you know about the various approaches, the better you're going to be able to make an informed decision. You also want to ask about what subject areas that they are proficient in, and this will make sure that they will be able to address all the needs of your child. Another good question is to find out what age groups they're most comfortable with or the age groups that they would like to work with. Because there are certain people who enjoy working with the older students more and there's others who enjoy working with the younger students. It's a quick and dirty way to figure out whether this person matches up with regard to your own child's age. And you also want to find out whether they screen or assess students. Are they offering any types of evaluations? And they might evaluate the baseline of where the child is beginning, or they might be proficient in reading neuropsych reports so that they don't need to necessarily do screening if you have current testing already done. I know that even when somebody comes with a neuropsych evaluation, or a psychoeducational evaluation that I still do some minor screening just to figure out exactly where I need to start with the remedial approach. So for example, I might I use a profile called the Good Sensory Learning Reading Assessment. And by giving it to the child, I'm able to start the intervention exactly where they need it. Next up, the question would be, do you teach executive function and study skills? Again, important relative to what your child actually needs. I mean, this is really a question of thinking about, uh, does the specialist understand how to help a child think about how they approach a task? Make sure that you're focusing on the right things. How you make sure that you maintain concentration and not get distracted. All those kinds of things that are really broader based process issues, as opposed to specific issues with regard to the content of reading and writing. Right, and I think also a simple way to think about it is that it really encompasses planning, time management, and organization. Another question is, how do you make a connection with your student? So if I can just jump in here, Erica, because of my background as a psychologist, I want to say this is a really super critical question because it really gets to the heart of the matter with regard to um, your comfort level and your emotional comfort level with allowing this person to work with your child. So asking this question kind of fleshes out, get a better sense for the specialist style. What kinds of tricks of the trade do they have, so to speak, with regard to being able to, to really connect with your son or daughter in a way that's going to engage them in the learning process? So it's really a great way to get to know them a little bit more quickly by finding out specifically, well, how are you going to really touch my child? How are you really going to be able to bring them in? and make a connection with them. How do you meet the individual cognitive needs of your students? And what this means is we're looking at the cognitive strengths and weaknesses. So how are they going to address specifically the remedial needs of the weaknesses? And also, how are they going to support those students' strengths? That's a good point. Now, uh, similar to the earlier question, how do you meet the individual emotional needs of your students? So this is really kind of connected to the question about how do you make a connection? The way I think about it is that, you know, this is a very emotional, stressful process for many kids to go through what they need to do to catch up and learn and, and deal with their learning differences. So I think it's important that you get a sense for how this person can help them maintain a positive attitude, help them feel 
good about their strengths. The way I describe it is that for many of these kids, six or seven hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, they're in an, an environment where they're constantly being bombarded with messages telling them that there's something wrong. So it's very important to work with a learning specialist who really understands how to turn that tie back to helping the child feel good about themselves as a learner. Yeah. It's like it's like you said the other day, Erica, when you said you never give homework, you give home fun. What do you call it? Home Home fun. Yeah. Home fun. Yeah. I thought that was awesome. Really oh, awesome. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. And another question you want to ask is, do you use programs or do you create your own approach for each student? I personally create my own approach for each student, but that means that you have to have a really in-depth knowledge base. A lot of people use programs, and what it does is this allows people to not really understand the depths of an approach, but they can follow a program. So a program is a very step-by-step -step approach. I personally find that many of my students don't need to go through a full program, that really almost they're like the game Jenga. I just have to fill in the missing pieces, whereas a program will take you through everything. Now, there are those students, particularly that are very young, that really need a comprehensive program that takes them through the whole thing so they get the big picture. So you can see there is a difference in those people that are comfortable in filling in the blanks versus those that offer programs. I think that's good. Now, what technology tools do you use? I'm going to ask for a little bit of help with this, Erica, because this is your area of expertise. But essentially, we're talking about not only what kind of tools do you use in terms of the platform of working with the child where you're doing the tutoring, but also, what's your awareness of the kinds of technology tools the kids can use, the apps, the Bookshare, the Learning Ally audiobooks, those kinds of things are so, so important today and are just really a, a fabulous way for the child to be able to start really showing what they're really truly capable of being without being kind of pitched off or blocked because of their other issues with reading and written language or whatever the problem is. Yeah. Which, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, there are so many cool technology tools out there that make it easier to write, that make it easier to read, whether it is voice to text or text to voice. There's word prediction, which helps with spelling. But there are all sorts of really cool tools out there that even help you to break down the research process when you're trying to do a research paper. So being aware of all of those tools is really nice. Okay, how do you maintain a multi-sensory teaching approach working online? Now, this is obviously a critical question, and it's something that people should be able to respond to you in a very concrete and specific way. And so you want to be able to just have a very concrete and very open conversation about specifically what that particular learning specialist does. So that, again, helps you get the emotional comfort knowing that they're going to be able to get as close as possible to replicating what it's like to be in the same room together. And then another thing that you want to ask is whether they have any references. Being able to actually speak to people or parents that have worked or their child has worked with that person in the past, it can be really, really helpful. And of course, it's important to ask them about their fees. I know as we spoke about earlier, there's going to be an opportunity because you have a national group to, of people to choose from, you're going to have an opportunity to take a look at what different people charge and what fits for your particular budget so that you don't feel like the fees are going to be a gating factor for you to get help that your child needs. So join us for the final video where we address what should online sessions look like?